Hey, it's Strawberry. The open beta for Mecha Breakers is out. And so I wanted to put out a beginner's guide to go over some of the basics because it is a mech game and some of the functionalities of how the game plays is gonna be different than some normal PVP or RPG style games that you might be used to. And the first thing I wanna cover, which is the biggest thing and th the thing that took me the longest to get adjusted to is the movement and engines in this game. If you're used to playing a hero shooter, an FPS, a Call of Duty, Battlefield, any of those, it's not quite as punishing on this. And because you are playing a mech, you're going to have to get used to the engine and mobility system, which took me honestly a couple hours to get fully adjusted to when I first started playing. It felt awkward. It felt chunky. And it's because you are playing a machine that needs to use thrusters and boosters. So if you look at the right side of your screen on the bottom right of your reticle, you'll see that blue curved bar that says EN at the top. That is your engine amount, and you can think of it as a stamina meter, just like you would in a Souls-like or some kind of action RPG. This is an action game, and so you're going to have to manage your stamina slash engine if you want to play the game. And I noticed a lot of people, especially me, when I first started playing, you get out and you're like, okay, I want to get into the battle, and you do, you know, a whole bunch of spam shots. You get out to the fight, and then all of a sudden you have no engine, and you're a sitting duck. So you have to get very used to managing your engines, maybe dropping to the ground, especially if you need to jump over a panther that's charging you. You need to dodge out of the way if a Narukami or an Oculus trying to shoot at you. If you've seen a Lizness coming towards you, you need to back up or something like that. You might need to save some engines on the back burner so you can actually use them when you absolutely need to. So part of that comes with Number one, the gameplay, the core gameplay of Mecha Break, but also with the different style of strikers slash mechs that exist in the game. The heavier and ultra heavy mechs are gonna have far less side to side, up and down, and also have far less engine, and every single striker in the game has a different recovery rate for the amount of engines that they have. So when you get to the light versions of these, not only do they have far more mobility side to side, up, down, stuff like that, they also can expend less engines when they move and they have far more engine recovery. So we just saw the Tricera that was moving around and now here's the Falcon, which is a light armor. So Lumine, Narukami, Aliznez, Falcon, all of these are gonna be far more mobile and have a lot more engines to expend because they need to use those as their defensive option. So you can press shift on PC to dash side to side. Um, I'm sure it's gonna be very similar on console and you'll be able to do move this way and this will give you some minor iframes. Just keep in mind that there are, are weapons in the game that are locked target systems and melees are part of a dash as well. If you're up against a melee character, they will dash forward and lock onto you. So you have to time your dashes to deal with that as well. However, if you wanted to just move, you can dash and hold your dash button, your shift button, and you will slowly consume engine while moving around. And again, this is gonna be different for each strategy and for each mech. So choosing to do this on a light character isn't really that big of a deal because my engines aren't really burning that bad. But if you get a heavy or ultra heavy and you decide to burn your stamina like this, you're gonna have to be very careful about how you do it. Because again, if you try to get around and you run out of engine at the core moment and you're just doing this not paying attention, It'll warn you and then you have this recovery, this force recovery. You see on the stamina bar where it goes up to that red bar, I can't dash until it reaches that red bar. So if I actually expend all of my engines and run out, I can't dash, I can't do anything, my engine's blinking, there's nothing left to give, I'm stuck, and then you have to wait until that. So you have to be very careful about your engines and also plan out how you're going to move depending on the character that you're playing. Next, let's talk about the roles in the game. And some of these are easily defined by the role listed on the character, but also kind of based on the meta and the map that you're playing against. There are currently two support in the game, the Panaka and the Lumine. One is light, very fast, a lot more heals. Panaka is, is medium with more shields and defense, but they both play the support. By the way, if you're looking for a full list of all the characters in the game, Game, all the strikers. I have a video that I can link down below in the comments and in the description that you can go watch and it just goes over each of the strikers in the game explaining what they do, what they're good at, and what they're all about. Then we have two snipers, two defenders, two brawlers, and five attackers. The brawlers and the attackers kind of all fit into the same style category, though usually the Welkin and the Panther are going to be focusing on isolating some of the squishier targets or holding down the flank in more of a defensive position, and in some cases the Panther will be looking for finishing off the target. But what you usually see in a normal team comp is you end up seeing usually like a Stego or a Tricera. So the Stego or the Tricera will be holding down the point. Tricera is very good at this. They have some, you know, they can hunker down and go into turret mode. So they can hold down on a point and they're holding that and they're keeping defense up. Now, obviously they have shields in all directions. They're able to hold that. But if you get to 
you know, the single target tank busters that are able to break right through that, like the Inferno or the Hurricane, they'll just destroy the, uh, the tank on point. Then you have the two support characters, the Luminae and the, um, the Pinaka that are trying to keep people alive. They can shield, put out buffs, put out heals and stuff like that. And they're able to really keep the team going and moving. And you can kind of rely on your team to have that, that play style. So you have your tanks and your support that are kind of keeping the midfield active. Then you have a few kinds of flankers and uh, initiators that are gonna kind of bring up the, the side of the fight that make a big difference. So when we look at that, we're gonna look at a few different mechas that have that kind of play style. Narukami is a big one. Narukami creates a lot of pressure because Narukami has a lot of damage out point from a flank. So you want to have this kind of at a distance. They'll be able to hook to a wall and look for long range sniping, dealing damage, picking things off, doing damage that way. And then you'll have the assassin style characters like Aliznez that's going to get up and close in melee, the panther that's going to get up close in melee, and they're all going to be kind of putting a lot of pressure that way. And then you also have uh, a little bit of burst damage from like Akula from a distance. So that's kind of like your main point. We put the Triceras and the Stegos on the point. We have the Luminaes and the Pinakas keeping them safe and playing mid-range. Then we have our long-range damage dealers like Narokami and the and some flankers with like Panther that are going around trying to pick people off, Aliznes that are going around to pick people off. The last role is one of the most important roles, and I would put it as more of a harasser role. And that's going to be Falcon the plane transformation, Sky Raider, the plane transformation, and Aquila. These guys create a lot of pressure at midfield and they're kind of putting out constant damage to keep that up. Aquila is kind of like the heavier version of the uh, Narukami and they kind of just float at mid range or just at the edge of the battle and they're sitting there just sniping, dealing damage, getting in on top of people, doing damage that way and not having these kind of pressure flanking, like harassing roles is really hard on some comps because you'd end up not having enough pressure to keep people in place and open up opportunities for your flankers to get kills or for you to capture points, which is really painful. And the last slot that I would consider as like an individual role is gonna be your tank busters. Uh, I wouldn't really put the Inferno and the Hurricane in full harassment te uh, territory, but what they do do is they're able to burst down tanky targets. These are your tank busters. So if you have a Tricera or a Stego stuck on the point, they're able to pop up their laser beams and do tons of single target damage and burn through those big tanky fights. Even if a Welkin tries to go in for a fight, everyone fears the Inferno and the Hurricane because if you get too close to the front of them, you're just going to disappear and evaporate. And that creates the whole playstyle. Now, of course, we're going to see a lot of people mixing together the different play styles, finding new ways to put the comps together. But in general, if you're missing any one of these roles, harasser, flanker, long range damage to a sniper, and then tank or support, you end up losing out a lot on your pressure with the objective. And I've definitely had games where we had everything but harassers. There was no Sky Raider going around putting out interference, and it meant that we couldn't move as much because we were getting pressured. We also had, I've had games where we didn't have an Aliznez or a Falcon or a panther and so their backline snipers weren't being taken out enough and we were just getting poked down i've had fights where there weren't any front line like we had no welkin we had no tricera we had no stego we couldn't capture any points we couldn't get to the objective and do anything because none of us were tanky enough to actually get there but it creates a lot of opportunity for interesting combos. Panaka could put a shield on an Aliznez and maybe create some frontline for a short period of time that way and other things like that. But this is like a general focus of what the actual gameplay looks like as of right now in the beta. Next, let's talk about damage types, armor types, and shielding, because this is something that you need to know well to understand the matchups in the game and how they work. So when you face an enemy, you'll see that they have a red health bar. This is their actual armor. And then they have a white uh, segmented bar above it. That is their shields. Most mechs specialize in either laser weaponry, like beam uh, weapons, or they specialize in like melee weapons or physical weapons. If you have a physical weapon, it's usually a howitzer or a machine gun or something like that. These generally aren't guided and aren't lock on in any way. They will lock on sometimes to do some damage, but they're kind of focused on dealing direct damage. These will usually chew through shields the worst. Your energy weapons are going to be your best at burning through shields and keeping those down. And then when it comes to melee weapons, most melee weapons in the game 
will go straight through the shields and go directly to armor, which is why flankers like Eliznez and Panther can be so exceptionally good, is that the characters that have a lot of shields but very little armor, you can burn right through that. So you can see when I melee with the Welkin, it's not damaging the shields at all. I'm going straight into the armor and I can finish him off that way by destroying him that because I, if I'm in melee range and I lock him in, there's no way for him to avoid taking that damage. So you want a good mixture of laser weaponry, guided missile weaponry, guided uh, lock-on weaponry, harassment damage, but you also want a good amount of damage that can do damage to armor as well, because you might have a very laser heavy team that can, you know, if they do damage to the shields and the shields go down and low and low, but you can't actually do damage to the armor when those are gone, that becomes a problem. The other thing you want to know about is going to be lock on weapons. This is a big part of the game and something that confuses a lot of people when they first start playing. There are a lot of things in this game that are manually targeted. We just saw one that will be manually targeted. Some of these weapons here like Inferno or Hurricane are, are they won't lock on like they won't actually have a lock on on the target they won't like you know be able to curve and follow them and do that kind of damage and there are also lots of mechanics in the game that can disrupt lock on targeting so one of them is going to be stego's smoke screen that when inside of it nothing can target but you can also have little things like this like little shields that go up from hurricane these will actually pull lock on targets to them, which means if you see these in the field, you're facing a hurricane. And if you have a lock on weapon that requires lock on, you can't manually aim it. It's going to aim at this instead of the enemy player. So you have to be very aware of those that go through. There's also limitations like the Sky Raider. So when the Sky Raider does his little support missiles, this will disrupt lock on as well. So when you're shooting through these, it will lower laser weaponry and, and drop off lock on as well. And another big one is going to be the smoke screen from Stego. So when you actually put this out, like you can't see it because I'm the one deploying it, but what you'll see is a shimmer of the mechs that are inside, friendly or enemy. They won't be able to be locked on. There's no like physical vision of them. You can just see little after images. And if you have lock on weaponry, you won't be able to lock on. So you either need to get really close to them when they're inside of that state or use weapons that don't require lock on. And that's part of making your team comp and your play style work. Next, let's briefly cover the modification and customization in here because it is something you will need to know about. It's not like you're on your first day it matters, but when you start getting into the system, it'll matter a lot. So you'll be able to collect mods through the, like just playing the game you'll get these drops and crates that come just by playing for free and then you'll get these modifications that have different stat bonuses and scalers on them that can you know, help you customize your play style even more and this is kind of part of their gameplay loop is playing enough to unlock these boxes and get enough of these to equip your weapon equip your character so inside the hangar you can go look at your weapons look at your character's functionality but you can also mod it to put in different mods in here as well currently in the beta these aren't like super complicated you can see that they they can, they can increase your regen speed but lower the capacity of fluid armor right you can you increase you can decrease the energy if you use cooldown but the threshold goes higher right a lot of these are trade-offs and stuff like that so you can actually create these and put these down and it helps you specialize your build you actually have all these different slots like you can put them in inside of different areas of the mech to create your part Again, I hope they flesh this system out as they get closer and closer to launch. And a lot of these just are pretty straightforward, like gain this, lose that kind of thing. But it is as part of the option, you can get that there. The next thing is you can also buy pre-made paint jobs for your mech, which allows you to like change the way they look. But there's also a custom system that you will need items for in the first place. One of the easiest ways to go there is just go to your inventory. And when you open box, you'll get these uh, paint options and you can just go to paint job. You can go to a character and you will be able to unlock colors and apply them to your character as well. So get that there. And then you'll just be able to customize your, your mech that way by applying different colors and different things to it. Paint it, you can do... Um, like arm, head, skeleton. You can do different patterns and change decals and stuff like that. But this option is here uh, in the menu that you'll be able to kind of mess around with as well. Or you can just go to the hangar, go to your character, go to paint job, and then click on the default because these are pre-made. These are the pre-mades that you can get. But click on the default and then you can go and look all the colors. You can even unlock colors as well if you wanted to have a specific schema for your character and look a specific way. This is, I think, currently are all only the uh, the soft currency in the game. That you 
you get for playing. There are also a lot of different modes in the game, and currently the matchmaking puts you through all of them randomly. If you play FPS games, especially like Counter-Strike, Call of Duty, or Battlefield, you'll recognize a lot of these, but let's quickly run through the different options, just so you're at least aware of what you're going to have to do while you're playing them. First, let's talk about Cape Blanc Observatory, and this one is just a Stratum Shatterer's game mode all you have to do with this one is periodically points will become available and you will have to go over to these points when they become active and hold your action button which is f on pc in order to capture it once you capture it it's done so everyone just fights over the point tries to get it so you can stand still long enough if you take damage you will be interrupted while trying to capture it and if you capture the point you will get a point for your team and it ends when all of those hash those little like chevrons at the top of the screen when those hashes end up filling up all the way the game is over that team has won and so there's a, a constant struggle going over it. There can be upwards of two or three active at one time. And your goal is either to create enough pressure to let your teammates capture the point while it's open, the dismantle will appear, or you want to go and capture it yourself. You see my teammate captured it, it got destroyed, we got a point, then the next point will start becoming active and you'll want to go fight for that. There's usually, if it's, if it's too slow on one, another one will come active, which means that if one team gets control of it, you can back off and go to the other one or you can split up your forces, but it creates a lot of team deathmatch in a actions around the point and the point is constantly moving around the map as well next up is the desert map eye of misra and this one is kind of like an uplink essentially what will happen is you have these three different points on the map that are really built to be uh, almost like bomb defusal points like you think more like um like like counter-strike or like valorant these are very complicated points with elevations and things like that and then a point at the center will start activating when it becomes active one of the players in the game can grab it and they need to escort it all the way over to the uplink location and start uploading it there's going to be some hash marks on the progress meter and as you upload it you get continuous points the person who's holding the uh, intel is actually going to be getting a small amount of points for their team every second so it starts building up and building up and then you want to go over to the uplink spot and defend that person until it's fully uploaded then you go to the next point and you can see the progress of each of the points at the top middle screen when they become active and when you want to grab them so your job is either to grab the intel and upload it at the uplink spot or try to stop the enemy from doing so and as it moves around there's different kinds of fights there's an interior location an exterior location a wide open location and all of that will kind of specify which mechs have the best opportunity to, to fight in that area and you want to make sure you limit the uptime that people have carrying it and whether they can get to the fight point and actually upload the data when you get done mercury shipyards is a double payload mission which means that you will start start in this area both teams will start with this cart that they have to push all the way to the end and you have two options you you either push your cart or stop the enemy from pushing theirs if no enemies are near their cart their cart will reverse and you're constantly doing a double payload throughout the whole mission trying to keep that safe so this is mercury shipyards it's a double payload you also get to points where when you progress far enough eventually you will get to a capture point area so you'll get in towards the center of the map as the carts get nearer it'll turn into a capture point this is like a, a comeback mechanic allowing you the other team to come back maybe they can start setting up at the capture point that happens at about 70 percent through or 66 percent through you can see the teams can capture it to help progress their cart forward or get some extra progress or speed things up this is just a catch-up mechanic in case one payload is too much further ahead than the other and then you push the rest of the 33 percent of the way to the end and whichever cart reaches the end that team wins and yes you can take turret characters and park their big fat butt on top of the payload and hold it down while you're going for it and then it creates a lot of opportunity for flanking characters to try and take people off the point and it also gives a lot of opportunity to the tank busters the infernos and the hurricanes to get get right on top of the tanks that are standing still and burn through them with their single target damage. The crop sinkhole is very straightforward. It's just a domination style capture point game. You have tickets that go up while you own capture points. If you have more than one capture point, your tick rate on your tickets goes up faster. And it's all about who can get to a thousand points first based on how many capture points they have. To capture the point, you just need to walk up to it. And same thing as the, uh, the, the first map we talked about, you just hold your action button on it capture it it's yours and you can hold it the enemy can come up and capture it anytime they want and it creates this constant struggle it's a basic domination mode that exists in many games even outside of fps that have shown up in many different ways 
capture the points, hold the tickets, try to fight. This is your Arathi Basin, your domination, whatever it is. Just trying to play around the interference and moving between parts to try and keep the most amount of tickets for your team. At some point, they may make this a little more complicated, but quite literally, you can sneak up right behind someone, start capturing the point without them realizing, and if they don't interrupt you in time, you can capture the point. And there's also some characters like Hurricane or Welkin that can deploy shields or the bully box around the point, and you just capture it. You can see, I just kept trying to capture it as a light character, walked in and snagged it, and now it's ours. <laughs> so you have different ways to play around that. And the last mode is gonna be Graceland Sky City, and this one is your or Counter-Strike Search and Destroy uh, style game mode. Uh, it doesn't have the bomb plant, but it is permadeath. So unlike all the other modes in the game, you don't have this constant reviving fight for struggle. It is a 6v6 elimination mode where you, if you die, you stay dead. There is one chance in the middle of the match that if you get some opportunity, you can move around the Sky City and you can actually try to find a resurrect, which allows you to resurrect one of your players on your team. But death is permanent, you're permadeath, and it does based on round. There's three rounds total in three different locations and you're trying to play as careful as you can this is when the support really come online those assassins and snipers make big difference if they can finish someone off and you have to be very careful with your life and I'm glad they included this kind of elimination mode because it's so different from the others that allows you to really play on the strengths and weaknesses of the different strikers in the game to create some unique experiences and hopefully that covers it I this video is already longer than it probably should be but I wanted to get at least a whole bunch of info out there again I have a video going over all the strikers if you want to check that out and figure out what striker is for you but I wanted to go over all the game modes the engine system which can throw a lot of people off the weapon system which is confusing at first and if you don't understand it you can wonder why you're not dealing damage to a target or why you're dying through your shields and stuff like that and hopefully this gives you a nice well-rounded understanding of the game so you can jump in and just have fun if you found value in today's video leave a like down below leave a comment for the algorithm to help this video get seen by more people and don't forget to check out my other channels for other content and other stuff and other things